Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the Compassionate. My name is Robert McCaw, and I am the National Government Affairs Director with the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE. Thank you all for coming here today. This news conference is to announce CARE's complete victory in our constitutional challenge to the federal terror watch list. Last night, in response to CARE's lawsuit, Al Hadi v. Cable, Judge Anthony Trenga of the Eastern District of Virginia Court ruled that the government has unconstitutionally failed to provide watchlisted persons with notice or an opportunity of those individuals to challenge their status. Uh, today we have several prepared statements by CARE National Executive Director Nihad Awad, CARE National Litigation Director Lena Marsri, CARE Senior Litigation Attorney Gadir Abbas, and one of our 23 plaintiffs, Hassan Shibli. Following these prepared marks, we will take some questions from the media and reporters here in the audience. Our first speaker is Nihad Awad. Thank you, Robert. Good morning, everyone, and assalamu alaikum. Peace be to you. Today is a historic day for all Americans, the American Muslim community especially, and all those who believe in the U.S. Constitution and the right of due process. The ruling against the terrorist watch list validates what CARE and the American Muslim community have been saying for nearly two decades, that the U.S. government has been treating American Muslims as suspect and as second-class citizens by placing thousands of American citizens on the watch list, which has resulted in many years of suffering, humiliation, harassment at airports, the borders, and even prevented Americans traveling abroad from flying back into the United States for no reason other than practicing their faith and being involved in their communities. <clears throat> I have personally witnessed many Muslim community leaders and activists nationwide, including myself, being placed on the watch list because they exercised their First Amendment constitutional right to worship, speak freely, assemble, and petition our government. Because of this, the community has suffered for many years without due process or legal recourse. The government, unfortunately, has shared this watch list with corporations, foreign governments, schools, animal shelters, medical facilities, and banks. Many banks have, in turn, closed accounts for private Muslim individuals, doctors, professionals, Muslim-owned companies for being on the watch list. Federal agents have used this list to stop American citizens at the border, handcuff them, detain them, question them about their faith, how many times they pray a day, which imam they, they, they follow, which school of thought they practice, and which mosque they go to, or their favorite verse of the Quran, and why they grow a beard, or wear a hijab, or the way they dress. It is important to note that CARE has an active lawsuit against Custom Borders Patrol for its discriminatory and unlawful practice of religious profiling and questioning at U.S. borders. All of these unconstitutional abuses started with a Muslim being on the watch list. And those violations of American Muslim rights are now coming to an end because of the courageous people who are on the watch list who decided to come out of the shadows and trust in care to fight on their behalf in the courts. And this victory could not have been possible without the amazing legal team at CARE under the leadership of Lina Masri and Gadir Abbas and this fabulous uh, attorneys, staff, and among them, of course, uh, Hassan Shibli, who is one of the plaintiffs. We could not have done this without the support of the community donors who believe in CARE's work. This fight is not over. 
we have more pending and upcoming legal challenges to the watch list. So stay tuned. Nationwide, CARE has hired 55 full-time attorneys. 22 of them have been hired in the past two years alone to fight for Muslim rights. For those who are watching on Facebook, we say thank you. Keep the fight. Please donate to CARE and support our work. Because of donors like you, fighting for your rights. Thank you for your support. And we thank our allies and foundations who believed in care and continue to support it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Nihad. Next, we have uh, CARE National Litigation Director, Lena Masri. Please take the stage. Thank you, and salam alaikum. My name is Lena Masri, CARE National Litigation Director. Yesterday evening, Judge Anthony Tranga of the United States District Court, Eastern District of Virginia, issued a 32-page opinion in response to a lawsuit that we filed on behalf of 23 innocent American Muslims that the watch listing system violates the basic constitutional due process rights of Americans. In his scathing opinion, the judge expressed deep concern that there is not even an ascertainable standard that the government is using to include innocent Americans in the terror screening database. And even worse, there is no ascertainable standard for excluding people from the watch listing system either. In fact, the federal government has utilized this program to cast an extremely wide net to capture as many American Muslims, innocent American Muslims, into the watch listing system. Or, as the judge explained, it is easy to imagine completely innocent conduct serving as the starting point for a string of subjective, speculative inferences that result in a person's inclusion in the terror screening database. Stringing together subjective and speculative inferences is precisely how the federal government has been able to cast a wide net before labeling these people as known or suspected terrorists. Our lawsuit uncovered layers upon layers of secrets that the government has kept from the public to allow it to expand the watch listing system beyond any stretch of the imagination. The federal government shares watch listings information with more than 18,000 state, local, county, city, university and college, tribal and federal agencies across this country. It shares the watch list with private 533 private entities that include railroads, hospitals, animal welfare organizations, information technology, fingerprint databases, and forensic analysis providers, among many others. And as a result, routine encounters with law enforcement who receive an alert and all they know about this individual they're interacting with is that they have been classified by the federal government as a known or suspected terrorist, a routine law enforcement encounter can be fatal. The watch list is also shared with foreign countries to restrict their travel abroad. Our lawsuit uncovered a secret government agency known as the Watch List Advisory Council, which is chaired by the Terror Screening Center and the National Counterterrorism Center a body that comprises of nearly every federal agency that makes decisions concerning the watch list. The watch listing system, make no mistake, has both terrorized and stigmatized the Muslim community without any modicum of due process. Innocent American Muslims have been stripped of their rights and labeled as known or suspected terrorists. For this reason, we have made the watch list, challenging the watch list, our number one priority in our CARE National Legal Department, 
and we have filed numerous lawsuits across the country on behalf of over 100 innocent American Muslims caught in the watchlisting system. Yesterday's opinion will pave the way for more victories in those cases as well. I want to thank our plaintiffs in this case who were at the front lines of challenging the watchlisting system. They've spoken on behalf of all Muslims who have had their lives devastated by the watchlisting system but haven't been given an opportunity to be heard. The courts have listened. The unfortunate aspect of our justice system is that in order to have standing to challenge a government policy, a plaintiff has to have been harmed by it. Our clients have been severely harmed. They've been handcuffed repeatedly at the border. They've been, one has been hospitalized due to confinement conditions at the border. There's been loss of employment, severe immigration delays, and worst of all, long-term separation from their loved ones. One of our plaintiffs in this case is a baby who was treated as a known or suspected terrorist while traveling. I want to thank each of them, and our nation should recognize them all as heroes. I also want to thank our outstanding CARE National legal team standing behind me that has committed thousands upon thousands of hours into this case and the others across this country, and Nihad Awad and, and CARE National for investing tens of thousands of dollars because you believed in our department and our ability to be successful in this case. And without that, our, this victory could never have happened. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from senior litigation attorney, Gadir Abbas. Uh, in the post 9-11 era, the Muslim community has come to expect to be harassed when they're traveling crossing a border and being detained is the expectation. Being singled out for screening at the airport is the expectation. What's different about this case is that 23 people mustered the wherewithal to stand up after the government designated them as worthy of permanent suspicion. They put their names in those briefs and they said that it was unjust what the government did. And this court, this court in Eastern District of Virginia listens. The whole watch list is illegal, not a small part of it, not the way they do it, the whole thing, the entire enterprise. Innocent people should be beyond the reach of an extrajudicial system of assigning people a second class status. Thank you very much. Uh, next we'll be hearing from Hassan Shibley, one of our 23 brave plaintiffs. Hassan. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, all praise is due to the Creator, the God of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Uh, I want to thank God, and then after that, thank the amazing legal team of CARE National, Gadir, Lena, Zaina, Justin, Caroline, Ahmed, who worked tirelessly to vindicate myself and millions of other American Muslims who for the last 15 years have become accustomed to being treated like second-class citizens, like suspects, like criminals, with our families, with our children, harassed, profiled, targeted every time we want to travel. Since I've been a teenager, every time almost that I want to travel, I get pulled aside by armed guards, sometimes placed in handcuffs, questioned about my religious beliefs, questioned about my religious practices, treated like a criminal, having done nothing wrong. And honestly, it's been an extremely traumatizing experience, one that is not unique to myself, but one that reflects the experience of what it's like to be an American Muslim over the last 15 years. And therefore, the victory that the CARE National Legal Team secured yesterday cannot be overstated. I've literally never been so happy, so excited. Because for the last 15 years, I and millions of Americans like me have been treated like second-class citizens by the government. And yesterday, the court vindicated us. The court said what we've been saying all along. 
What I've personally been saying to DHS and CBP and the White House and Congress for the last 15 years, that how the DHS has been treating American Muslims when they travel is unconstitutional, is un-American, is unjust, is oppressive. Yesterday, the court vindicated us. The reason so many Muslims like myself, and the fact of the matter is this, in my own personal experience, I've witnessed that just about every American Muslim that I know is either on the watch list or knows somebody on the watch list. The watch list practically impacts the entire American Muslim community. But not just the American Muslim community, because when we as American Muslims are targeted because of our religion, that undermines the freedom for all Americans. So yesterday's victory was not just one of the greatest victories in the history of the United States for the American Muslim community, but it was in fact one of the greatest victories for all Americans and for all people in the United States, and one of the greatest victories for the Constitution. Yesterday's victory makes me proud to be an American, makes me proud to be part of the CARE family. And honestly, it's my own personal experience of being treated like a second-class citizen and stigmatized and harassed at the border that inspired me to become a civil rights attorney, to intern with CARE, and now to run CARE Florida, and eventually become a plaintiff in this lawsuit, but help many others in other situations. It's gonna inspire us to keep fighting our fight as uh, Executive Director Nihad Awad of Care National said is not over. We're going to continue this fight to ensure American can be a, uh, America can be a place where children of all people, regardless of their race or religion or ethnicity, can grow up proud of who they are without fear of intimidation or harassment. So I want to thank you all. I want to thank all the Care National supporters. I want to thank all the members of the media who've been covering this issue for years. And, mo and I absolutely want to thank the amazing leadership of Lena Gadir, Caroline, Justin, uh, and the, the Zaina and the rest of the amazing CARE national team for securing yesterday's tremendous victory for the American Muslim community and for all Americans. Thank you, and God bless you. Peace be with you. Wassalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Uh, now we will move on to our next segment where we uh, open the podium for questions from the press and media. Uh, after we conclude the Q&A, speakers will be available for one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, front, yep. Um, what What's next? Uh, you know, have you been talking to the Department of Justice or the FBI on how to uh, move forward on this? Um. Yeah. Well, the the court declared the watch listing system broadly illegal, and so now the question is what the court's going to do about it. And part of what's going to happen next is we're going to read the tea leaves. His analysis implies the remedy. And so w one particular area of promise for us is his analysis of the actual inclusion standard, the standard that they use to include people. And he basically said it's nonsense, that it's um, a, a vague nonsense that uh, amounts to not having a standard at all. And so if you change the inclusion standard, you have rewritten um, how watch list thing works in, in the U.S. And is that what you want, or do you want yes. to be thrown out? Yes. Uh, 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 we... Um, I, I, you know, those are, <laughs> we're, we're um, uh, working on that, and so in the next 30 days, you know, we'll have um, a, a firm position on, on what's going to happen, what, what our view is on what the Constitution requires the watch list to be like. Uh, as far as we can tell, uh, the list is essentially a list of Muslim people. Um, there, there have been um, folks of, uh, that are not Muslim. Um, uh, for example, Laura Poitras, uh, who um, uh, did that documentary about Edward Snowden a few years ago, won an Oscar for it. She lives in Germany now because for years, um, after doing a trilogy of documentaries about the Iraq war, um, was searched every single time she crossed their border, her electronics were taken from her often. And so we do see what we'd expect of a secret government watch list. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it applies to a minority group, an unpopular minority group, the Muslim community, and political activists. How many people are being There's more than one million people in total on the watch list. Yeah. Question right there. So, yep. so since the court has asked you to present arguments, what is the remedy that you're going to propose going forward? Since you said the watch list is illegal, are you just trying to change the inclusion standards? 
So the, the, just, the question is, uh, what are we trying to do? What do we want the court to do as a remedy? Um, uh, we, we don't believe that innocent people, people who have not been arrested, charged, or convicted of a violent offense, um, uh, can be placed on a secret watch list. And so at a bare minimum, those innocent people should be protected from this extrajudicial process. Beyond that, there's all there's a whole host of concerns that are certainly going to be the focus of the um, additional processes in the future. For example, we know that the government disseminates watch listing information to 18,000 uh, local state law enforcement entities and more than 500 private entities. But the truth of the matter is, one of the great mysteries of the watch listing system now is what are these private entities doing with their watch list information? We don't know. And so we think that there's a mismatch between the willy-nilly approach to dissemination that the federal government has taken and the consequences that are visited upon those people. So uh, certainly a tighter fit between those two is, is important. Um, so would you be looking for a way to get people off of the watch list? Of course. Like it still stands? Yeah. Uh, all innocent people, innocent people that have not been arrested, charged, or convicted of a terrorism-related offense have no business being on, the, on this watch list. And it, it's, it's, our, it's our position that the Constitution does not give the federal government the ability, the authority, to put innocent people on the watch list. Yeah. So the um, Justice Department can go to Supreme Court next. Uh, do you think that is a likelihood? Well, there's a, there's a lot of steps between um, uh, now and something like that happening. In addition to the court needs to decide what he's going to order the government to do in response to that. Um, but there's pending litigation all across the country, in Oregon, in Texas, in Maryland, in Utah, in the Ninth Circuit, in the Tenth Circuit, there's just a ton of litigation. So, um, uh, you know, this will kind of continue to creep up, but there's a lot before we get to that point. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on the role that the uh, Secret Watch List Advisory Council played throughout this process and maybe who some of the members are? Yeah, the, the Watch List Advisory Council, uh, we learned of the first time during a deposition of the FBI last March, March 2018. And it was, it's a, it's a supra agency body that is, that is chaired by the Terror Screening Center and the NCTC. And essentially every single federal agency is a member of this. And the language that they use to describe the watch list, they call it the watch list enterprise because it really is a government, a federal government wide effort to deploy the watch listing system in every manner that they can uh, come up with. And so here, the, um, uh, the Watchlist Advisory Council is, is, the, is the body that sets government-wide policy uh, about the watch list. And it's, it's about the Department of State exporting watch list information to foreign countries and in, in exchange receiving foreign watch list information and dumping it into databases that then TSA uses to conduct screening not only of travelers, but of their employees. And then DHS takes the information that they get from nuclear energy um, companies and uh, other infrastructure companies and uh, uh, screen people against the watch list and collect information that gets exported to another agent. So it really is um, this ominous, dystopian, um, a process that the federal government's using that's unprecedented. There w there's never been something like the watchlisting system in American history. Yeah. Um, the judge has said that the standards are vague, the current standards, but what are they? How does someone like Mr. Shibley end up on the watch list? Is it just faith? Are there other elements that go into it? Um, so as a practical matter, because the standard is contentless, the federal government will be able to put on the watch list, whoever it is that they want to put on the watch list. And so what we've seen is that the watch listing system is trained on the Muslim community. And because it's trained on the Muslim community, they're able, and there's no, there's no standard that, uh, that has any content that they're required to meet, they're able to just dump people on the watch list. And so what we see is that watch listing occurs in clusters. 
Um, the FBI field office, for whatever reason, many, many years ago, started focusing on the Oregon Muslim community. We saw a cluster of watchlisting cases from there. We see a, wa a cluster of watchlisting cases in the Northern Virginia area. There's a cluster of Washington cases among Muslim community leadership, imams, activists, institutional leaders. Those folks are networked. And so one, one, when one gets watchlisted, your association with that person becomes a basis of your own listing. So going forward, what specific standards are you looking for for someone to be in included in the watch list? Like, ideally, what would those standards be, and how are you going to um, watch out for national security concerns? Um, well, we have the advantage here of dealing with a program that in its entire existence has accomplished nothing. Not a single person who's committed an act of terrorism inside the United States since 9-11 was placed on the watch list when they committed their despicable crime. Not a single one. So the federal government has been wrong amazingly, even though they've cast a wide net to include more than a million, they've been wrong 100% of the time. And there are statistical reasons for that. There are, you just can't, if you're looking for an extremely rare event, 150 perpetrators of acts of terrorism among 300 million people. Even if, you, if, you, even if your tool, even if your standard and your operations mean that 99% of the time you look at someone, you'll be able to tell whether or not they're actually a terrorist. That means, because it's so rare, your list, even if it's 99% accurate, and trust me, this one is not 99% accurate. Even if it's 99% accurate, you'll end up with a list of, with hundreds of thousands of innocent people. It's in the nature of large numbers that this is a folly. And so whatever the particulars of the standard, the outcome is what's most important, that innocent people who have not been convicted, arrested, or charged with a violent offense um, are shielded from this extrajudicial process. Okay. Anything else? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you.